Well, hey, Connect. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Chris. Get to serve on the team here. And thrilled you decided to join us today. We're going to answer a question, begin to answer a question that we've all asked many times in life. How do I make the most of my life? How do I make the most of my life? You know, in different seasons, the question might be phrased a little differently. As a kid, we're asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And then we grow up and we're a young adult and we find ourselves wondering, what's my calling? We hit 40, we have a midlife crisis, we just question everything. And then, even later in life, we still find ourselves asking, what's next? What does is, what is this new season provide? What does this look like? Time and again, we come back to this question, how can I make the most of my life? And we make an honest effort to answer this question. As a kid, we'll meet with a career counselor at school to try to discern what, what should I want to do when I grow up. We'll uh, take the Enneagram personality assessment or another similar assessment to understand ourselves more, and then we'll devour a book like The Road Back to You or a similar work and try to understand like, who we are and how we can make a difference with our life. We'll even pay good money to see a life coach who can help us understand who we are and decide what's next. We're heavily invested in answering this, this nagging question and rightly so, because the life we live and the legacy we leave is dependent upon how we answer this question. If achievement and accolades are what matter most to us, oh, then we're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to push ourselves to the limit, maybe even past the limit, to solve the problem or get the promotion. If it's entertainment that we're after, then every dollar we make, every moment we get, it's going to be spent on the game, going to the mountains, going on vacation, checking off things in our bucket list. If caring for our family is what matters most, then we're going to bend over backwards. We're going to do whatever it takes to care for our kids and one day grandkids. We're heavily invested and we will do whatever it takes to do what we think matters most in life. Now, more than an existential question, I think this question is a spiritual question. And here's why. I believe God placed that desire in us. And the reason I believe that is because of what we read in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Let me just read this for us. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. By God's grace, we are saved from our life of sin so we can experience life in a relationship with God. And the gospel is also that God created us with a purpose, a way that we can be a part of his work in this world. And we're going to take a look at what that looks like today. And we're going to do it by looking at a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. So if you've got a Bible with you, open with me to Romans chapter 12, 1 through 8. If you need a Bible or a place to jot down notes, you can follow along in the church app. We are in week six of Rooted. And this week, we're opening up the discussion around this question, how can I make the most of my life? We're not going to fully answer that question today but we're going to get the conversation going. You're going to continue it in group this week. And then next week, we're going to talk about it again from a different angle. And you're going to talk about it more. We got two weeks of trying to answer this question, but I believe we can because God's word is clear on this matter. Now we're in week six of Rooted, and this has been an incredible journey thus far. I mean, we're, we're putting down deeper roots because we want to grow. We want to experience transformation. And what we have come to find is that that transformation we desire, it comes through connection with God, the church, and our purpose. Now, as we double-click on that purpose element, let's pause, let's pray, and let's just ask that God be the one who speaks to each one of us now. Lord, we come before you, eager to encounter you, eager to know you more, and we would ask that you would answer this question for each of us that you would speak, your spirit would speak in this time, speak through your word, speak through me. And would that continue as we gather in groups this week? And would you help us to get just crystal clarity around how we can be a part 
of what you created us to be a part of. And as we join you in fulfilling the purpose you have for us, would we experience you more? Would we know you more? And would we see others know you too? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, what we're about to read is from a letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to a church plant in Rome. And he wrote this to the church in the first century. So some of their context is a little different from ours. We'll talk about that. But what you, we do need to know up front is up to this point in the letter, we're jumping in at chapter 12, but the first 11 chapters, Paul did a deep dive into the richness and depth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that God sent Jesus to save us from our sins so we can experience life with God. Paul nuanced it in great detail. It's probably the greatest explanation we have of the gospel, the first 11 chapters of Romans. And in light of all of this, Paul then writes the following, beginning in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, in light of the gospel, the fact that God sent his one and only son, and Jesus gave his one and only life, so that you and I can have life with God. Therefore, in light of the gospel, in view of God's mercy, Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You know, the idea of offering sacrifices, it's pretty foreign to us today. We don't do that in our everyday lives. We don't even do that when we gather for worship on Sundays. But back then, it was very familiar. What was what's foreign to us was familiar to them. The Greeks would offer sacrifices to please and appease the gods. That's what their hope was. Jews would offer sacrifices to God for the forgiveness of their sin. Offering sacrifices was normative back then in the first century. And Paul, speaking to that first century audience, he flips their whole paradigm on its head. And he's like, look, you don't need to offer sacrifices to please and appease God. He's not mad at you. God loves you. And because God loves you so much so that he sent his son as a sacrifice for you, because God loves you so much, therefore, in view of his mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The way we live our lives, that's how we worship. It, 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 you know, this is our, our true and proper worship, Paul says, because, because God went first, because he sent Jesus, and Jesus sacrificially gave his life for us, we give our lives as a sacrifice. It's the way we live. It's the way we worship. You see, worship isn't a sacrifice you bring to a religious service. Worship isn't simply a song you sing. Worship is how we are to be living. This is the life we're called to. Our lives should actually look more like Jesus and less like the world the longer we've been following him. The way we spend our time, the way we spend our money, all of those things, everything, it should look more like Jesus and less like the world around us. And it, it's worth pausing every once in a while and just asking the question like, do my neighbors, do my coworkers, do my friends and family, do they see something so different in me from everyone else around them that they would even want to ask why? Because our lives should be radically different from the world around us. Uh, Paul says it this way, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The, the way of the world is to make making a difference all about us. Like, we make a difference so that others think well of us, think we're great. Like, oh, he, he's such a great husband, such a loving leader such a passionate preacher. Those are the things that I want to hear. Like in my flesh, that's what I want to hear. And the world would say, go seek it, go pursue it. But the way of the world makes it all about us, me, 
you. The way of Jesus is different. The way of Jesus is to make it all about God. God is great. God is loving. God is passionate. He gave his one and only son, after all. So everything, everything is about him. It's not about you or me. The only proper response to God in his greatness, his love, his passion, his mercy, the only proper response to his mercy is to live our lives for God's glory. Worship isn't just something that we do on Sundays, though when we gather on Sundays, we worship. Worship is how we live every day because everything we do, whether we're at home, we're at work, we're out in the community, we're here, it can all be done for God's glory. And as followers of Jesus, our lives just look different. They look different from the lives of those around us. You see, when everyone else is figuring out how they can get away on the weekend, we're anticipating gathering together to praise Jesus together. Uh, when, when they're loving those who look like them, we are seeking to love those who don't even look like us. When everyone else is, is trying to guard their me time, we're looking for opportunities to be about someone else's interest, to lay ourselves down for their good. Please don't mishear me. There's nothing wrong with vacations. There's nothing wrong with me time. There's nothing wrong with these things, even loving people who look like us. There's just a couple of things. Even the world does that. And vacations, me time, loving those who look like us, they don't make for a great life purpose. But Jesus does. Jesus makes for an incredible life purpose. While the way of the world is to focus all the attention on ourselves, our personality, our passions, our interests, the way of Jesus is to focus on God. That, that he is good, that he is loving, that he is merciful. And in view of his mercy, we live differently. Now, we know that, that Jesus changes us. He's the one who flips the paradigm in our own lives. He's the one who shifts our focus from looking in the mirror to then reflecting glory to God. Let's continue to see how Paul f fleshes this out further. Verses uh, 3 through 5. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Uh, years ago, I had an Achilles heel in my character, and I didn't even know it. My mom knew it. She pointed it out to me, though she wouldn't tell me what it was. All she would say is, Chris, there is a sin in your life, and only God can reveal it to you. Not exactly what every teenage boy wants to hear. But she was right. And God did eventually reveal that to me. He actually revealed it through an experience in college. I was a freshman at Colorado Christian University, and I applied to be a resident assistant for my sophomore year. Now, backstory, every job I'd ever applied for in life, I got. So I was already, like, excited about this possibility. I was making plans. Honestly, I was pretty pumped about the prestige that was going to come with this position on campus. And I was gearing up for it. So I was shocked when I opened the mail at my mailbox that day and read the, the letter that said I did not get the position. I was baffled. I didn't say it out loud, but I sure thought, who wouldn't want to hire me? And here's the irony of the whole thing. Everyone else saw what I was blind to. My pride blinded me to my pride. I thought I was all that and then some, that I had the best ideas, that I could solve any problem, that I was the right person for any job. And it wasn't until I was humbled that I realized what Paul was talking about here and we see through the rest of Scripture. All of us, all of us are called as followers of Jesus to live humble lives. We're supposed to represent Jesus' character to the world around us. 
C.S. Lewis has famously said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It all has to do with our focus and what we're focused on. Are we focused on ourselves or are we focused on the one who is greater than us? This kind of service that Paul said we should, uh, should characterize us, he describes as follows. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Sober judgment. What's that all about? Is that like not drinking and driving? Not a bad idea? Don't recommend that? Not what Paul's talking about here, though. Paul was getting at something different. Sober judgment is position and perspective. Position in perspective. You see, we're not just like part of the church. We're part of the body of Christ. As our bodies have different members, hands, feet, mouths, eyes, ears, as, as our bodies are composed of different body parts, the church is composed of different body parts, each with a respective function. And the crazy thing about being part of a body, whether it's our physical bodies or the body of Christ, is each member is dependent upon the others. It's a beautiful metaphor. The mouth is no good without hands, because nothing would get done without hands. Hands aren't going to be able to get to everything without feet to take them there. Feet aren't going to know where to go without eyes that see. And it goes on and on. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I just hope you're not the appendix, because then you're useless. In our diversity, we're we're unified, we're united under Christ. He's the head of the body. We see this elsewhere in Scripture. And I I appreciate the reminder from Paul Tripp. He's an author, pastor, and he says this, talking about the body of Christ. If Christ is the head of his body, then everyone else is just body. Mouth, hands, foot, eyes, it doesn't matter what role you play. We are all equal under the head, Jesus We each have a part to to contribute. We have something we can do. We can add value, but we are not the most valuable. All of us just play a position on the team. We're dependent upon each other for the, the success of the whole. Now, when I think of the position that I get to play in this body, on this team, I get to serve as the lead pastor. And as I look back on that season in my life in college and the pride that just consumed me, I think that probably would disqualify me for doing what I'm doing now if I wasn't humbled the way I was back then and then the Holy Spirit just working through the whole process, changing me. I'm still in process, but I've come a long way by God's grace since then. And pride would have me believe that my opinions are the best opinions, that just because I sit in the seat that I sit, I should just be able to call every shot and it's going to be what's best for everyone. But what God has taught me is that we is better than me. Uh, just last month, we transformed this whole room because we added a third kid's room. It's awesome. Well, we thought, I thought, it'd be great if we had the stage over here and it was you know, more like, kind of like a little bit rounded approach. I thought, this is going to be great. And then we set it up and realized, Garrett realized, I, I didn't, I was like up here on the stage. You couldn't see anyone. Like you couldn't see the people on the stage or the TVs. Every seat had a sightline problem. So after the service, Garrett very graciously was like, hey, what do you think about this setup here? And I'm so glad he spoke up because my opinion's not always the best opinion. And I love being part of a team, a church, where the best idea wins because the mission's way more important than my pride. And people thinking, oh, he's so smart. Pride, though, pride would would have me think that I, as the pastor, I'm the best person to care for every need, every time, all the time. And I do want to be a caring pastor, but I tend to be a little slow on the uptake. That's what I've realized as of late. In fact, Alex, our Connections resident, is far better at this than me. Just to give you a quick example— Last week, Amanda, my wife, suggested, hey, we should do something to care for people in our church who are going through a hard time. I'm like, that's a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of it? Because God gave me my wife. So she, she shares this. I'm like, great, I'm going to talk to the team about this tomorrow. So I talk to the team, and I'm like, guys, what should we do? And they're like, we're already doing it. 
Alex is taking the lead. It's happening. And I was like, that's awesome. Because more than wanting you to think I'm a caring pastor, I want Connect to be a caring church. And because of people like Alex and many of our group leaders and many of our group members, we are. We are a church who cares. You see, we all have a position to play on this team. And the team, the church, is going to struggle to accomplish the goal unless we all play our position. Now, to be painfully clear, what are we shooting for? We're shooting to connect the disconnected to a growing relationship with God. It's why we are here as a church. And we know that we is better than me. So to accomplish this goal, we've got to contribute. We've all got a part to play. Not one of us is more important than the others of us, no matter what title we have. Jesus is the head of his church. We're just body. But man, a body without a hand is in a hard position. A body without eyes is in a tough position as well. So, this isn't just a me thing, this is a we thing. We must serve humbly. We must properly understand our position and then go play our position. Paul called out the much-needed contributions of the body, of the church, of us, as follows. Verses 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What are these different gifts that Paul talks about here? Are these like skills and abilities that we have? Kind of, but not exactly. You see, we're all born with different talents, skills, abilities, and those are good things. And we should use those to be a part of what God is doing. But there's something unique about these spiritual gifts that Paul's referencing here. You see, unlike our natural talents and abilities, spiritual gifts are given to us by the Spirit of God when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So if you don't follow Jesus and he's not Lord of your life, you can try as hard as you want but you don't have any spiritual gifts yet. But when we receive Jesus, he, in his goodness, his spirit just gifts us. And here's the thing. It's not for our benefit. That's another distinguishing characteristic of a spiritual gift. It's for the building up of God's church in the advancement of his kingdom. Elsewhere, Paul wrote this about spiritual gifts. He says, Now to each one the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Rather than for being our, for our good and for our glory, God gives us spiritual gifts for others' good and for his glory. It's all about him and his purposes. Now, with this in mind, the, the, you know, who gives us these gifts? It's God. And why he gives them for us, the common good, building up of his church, the advancement of his kingdom, ultimately his glory. We know the who, we know the why, how. Like, how do we contribute? How do you and I play our part on the team? Well, Paul lists several spiritual gifts, and I'll reread them back in Romans 12, 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, he lists a bunch of spiritual gifts here, but it's not an exhaustive list. If you looked at 1 Corinthians 12, you would see other spiritual gifts listed there as well. You could read that this week if you want a, a fuller perspective. Regardless, Paul's point is clear in Romans 12. God has gifted you, so humbly use your gifts. This isn't about you. This isn't about me. This is about him. And if he has gifted us, we are to use those gifts for others' good in God's glory. Now, as a pastor, I'm often asked a, a very logical question. How do I know what my spiritual gifts are? And I appreciate the three-step approach that they put in the Rooted book this week. I think it's on like day five. And there we see this three-step approach. Examine, experience, evaluate. 
Let me just share a little bit of my story and one of the gifts that God has given me, that others have told me God has given me, and what it looked, what it's looked like, that examine, experience, evaluate, all right? <clears throat> so, something you probably wouldn't expect about me is I hate public speaking, always have. Class presentations were my least favorite thing. Every class presentation, I had a debate in my mind, do I go first and get it over with, or do I wait until the end and hope that Jesus comes back or I die first? Like, I did not want to do it. My stomach would get queasy. My hands would sweat. I wanted nothing to do with it. I don't care if there were just five people in the room. I was like, I do not want to do this class presentation. Even still, when I get up to publicly speak, I'll feel my heart race a bit, and I'll feel my hands start to get a little sweaty. And uh, after I, I spoke once, um, I preached a message, I had someone come up to me, a very well-meaning person. They meant this in encouragement. They said, have you ever thought about being a motivational speaker? And I literally laughed out loud because that sounds horrible. Like, I, that's, I do not want to be a motivational speaker. And you're like, okay, then why do you do what you do? Like, part of the role is you preach regularly. Let's, let's get, like, how do, why do I do this? And it's not as painful as public speaking is. You see, uh, what I found, people would tell me this in high school. When I would teach the Bible in various contexts, people would share how they got to know God more and they, they grew in their faith. I was like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. I'm seeing this pattern start to form. And then I tried to just practice it, kind of get some experience under my belt. And... Uh, one of the, the first times I really got like a lot of reps preaching or, or teaching was as a middle school pastor. I was doing that while I was at seminary, and I remember I was so pumped for the job. I was going to make a difference in the kids' lives, just like my youth pastor made in my life. And I get up and I preach my first message to like a dozen middle schoolers, and my supervisor was in the room. And afterwards, he said, how do you feel like it went? I'm like, I feel like it went pretty good, don't you? And he said, well, if you were talking to your peers, it might have been okay. But that was terrible for middle schoolers. Ouch. But he was right. But I kept, I kept getting experience. I kept trying. Then with college students and young adults. And then my pastor asked if I would be willing to preach on Sundays. So I started to preach on Sundays. And as I did this... Each time I would just ask people for feedback, people I, I trusted, people who I knew loved me and loved the church, and I would just say, hey, what worked, what didn't, tell me, help me learn, help me grow. I would also watch myself on video. There is nothing more painful than watching yourself on video. But I wanted to learn, and I'm like, if people have to endure this, I need to endure this. So I would just take this in and learn and evaluate. And then there was this day, I was actually it was with a bunch of interns at a church in Maine, and we were reading 1 Timothy together. And as we were reading 1 Timothy 4, Paul's instruction to his protege Timothy just struck a chord with me. Uh, it was like I was convicted, and I'm like, I've got to take action on this. And here's what we read that day. It says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in impurity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and in your hearers. And when I read that that day, it just like cut to my heart. And I, I felt very, just this conviction. I'm like, I've got, to, I've got to lean into this gift that others are saying I have. So I talked to my pastor about it, and we started to cultivate that gift all the more. Now, I get a lot more reps these days than I did back then. That was like six years ago when I felt cut to the heart like this. And talked to my pastor, and, and he kind of came alongside me and coached me and developed me. And then four years ago, we moved out here, and we've been doing Connect Church ever since. Well, 
I get a lot more reps now than I did back then because I'm preaching a lot more often. Not every message is a home run, and that's okay. My hope is that my prayer is not for home runs. My prayer is that when I preach, that God would move, that he would speak. I don't care if you or anyone remembers what I said. I don't need to be quoted. I just want people to encounter God. And when I hear stories of people encountering God, it makes me think, okay, I'll keep leaning in. I'll keep growing in this and let the Holy Spirit speak and move. There's a, there's a quote in the, the, from the movie Chariots of Fire. Eric Little is a runner. He, he's running in the Olympics, and he makes this quote. He says, or he doesn't make a quote. He says this, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Another fun fact about me, I actually ran competitively in high school. I have run since, and I can assure you, when I run, I feel no pleasure. Zero. But when I preach, wow, do I feel God's pleasure. I may hate public speaking, but I come alive preaching. And you can experience the same. Not because you're supposed to be a preacher or a teacher, but because God has gifted you by his spirit. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have a spiritual gift. You may even have a couple spiritual gifts. None of us have all the spiritual gifts because we need one another. That's how God designed his body. But my encouragement to you would be to take some time and examine, reflect on your life and, and see where, where you've seen God move through you in the past experience. Just try it out. If you feel like you've got a gift of hospitality, just have some people over. Try it out. Or maybe serve on the connections team and see if that is, is you know, clicking and resonating and others are feeling loved and welcomed by you. Just try. Experience it. And then evaluate. Get some feedback. People who love you, who know you, people from your community group, people from your serve team to speak in and say, hey, when you do that, this is how I experience God through you. Do more of that. Because my guess is that they're not only experiencing God, you are too. At least that's been my experience in preaching. So, back to our question. How can I make the most of my life? Oddly enough, the answer is not more self-reflection, self-discovery. That's just not going to cut it. We need to shift our focus. We, being the Holy Spirit in us, needs to shift our focus from ourselves to God. When our, our eyes are fixed on Him, when we're all about Him, then in light of the gospel, in view of God's mercy, humbly use the gifts God's given you to accomplish God's purposes for God's glory. Connect Church would not be what it is without many of us serving humbly, using our gifts. And we don't get it right every time because some of us are in the experiment phase. That's great. This is training ground because the church isn't the end goal. God's glory is, and more people knowing him is part of that. So we go out from these walls, and we're going to talk a lot more about what does our purpose look like lived out in the day-to-day -day next week. But for now, just know this. We is truly better than me. And if we as a church are to experience all that God has for us as a church and to express his love to South Denver, then we need you to play your position because we can't operate as a body without a foot or without an eye or without an ear. We need each other. And together, as we humbly use the gifts that God's given us, then together we get to accomplish his purposes and we get to bring him glory. And it is so good. And the crazy thing is that when we do this, it actually grows us in our faith, grows us in our relationship with him. And maybe, just maybe, we'd get to be a part of others connecting with Jesus and growing in a relationship with God too. Let me pray for us. Lord, you're so good. You're so, so good. And thank you that we get to know you, that we get to, to have a life with you and it's all because of Jesus. So in view of your mercy, in light of the gospel, would you open our eyes to the gifts that you've given us as we follow you? Would you fan those, those gifts to flame? Would you use uh, each of us to encourage one another in the, in the use of the gifts? And God, as we use our gifts, would 
Jesus, you, the head of your body, would you get the glory, all of it, Lord? And would people experience your love when they're with us, whether it's corporately like this or in another setting, would people experience your love through us? We ask all of this for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. We hope that the message encouraged your faith. If it did, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend to encourage them too. My name's Chris. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Connect Church, where we believe that life with Jesus and life with others is best. That's why we exist as a church to connect the disconnected to a growing relationship with God. And we do that in a couple of ways. First is help you connect with Jesus through our weekly services. Second, connect with people through joining a community group where you can make some friends and grow in your faith. And third, connect people with Jesus by serving and sharing your story with others. I hope to see you at a worship service soon. And in the meantime, be sure to download our free church app by searching Connect Church Community in your phone's app store. The app is the best way to stay up on everything that's going on around Connect. Let us know how we can help you get connected by filling out a Connect card, find a group, and even give to help see this mission and ministry advance so that more lives can be touched with the good news of Jesus. You can connect with God, community, and your purpose, and we're here to help. See you soon.